Imagine standing alone in a dimly lit alleyway when all of a sudden a shadowy figure emerges from the darkness. He approaches, silent and purposeful, holding a briefcase in one hand and a revolver in the other. Without a word, he hands you a six-chamber revolver loaded with a single bullet, then opens the briefcase to reveal one million dollars in crisp one hundred dollar bills. His offer is simple. Point the gun at your head and pull the trigger. If you survive, the money is yours. Under these circumstances, would you play? And no, we're not just gonna ice the student, run off with the money, okay? We're we're honorable men and women, no cheating. No cheating. In this scenario, the question essentially boils down to would you tolerate a one in six chance of death for a five in six chance of winning a million dollars? Our decision is likely to be a highly emotional one as we are all emotional creatures at heart, but what if we want to look at this problem quantitatively? Is there a way to objectively measure this risk? Thankfully, there is. In probability theory, the concept of expected value helps us understand the mean or long-term average of random outcomes. We can express the expected value of a random variable x with this equation. But this equation is a little ugly to look at, so we're going to simplify it for our purposes. In this equation, there are only two possible outcomes. x1 represents the value of the first outcome, while p1 represents its probability of occurring. Likewise, x2 and p2 represent the value and probability of the second possible outcome. Let's illustrate with a quick example. Imagine a game where we flip a fair coin. If it lands on heads, you win a dollar. If it lands on tails, you win nothing. To calculate the expected value, we would first input the value of landing on heads, winning a dollar, and then its corresponding probability, 50%. Next, we do this with the second possible outcome, landing on tails. The result, 0.5, represents the long-term average of playing the game. Note that it's impossible to actually win $0.5 on a single flip, but if you played the game many, many times, the average amount you'd win per flip would converge to about $0.5. Now let's apply this to our game of Russian Roulette. There are only two outcomes. You survive and win the million dollars with a 5 in 6 chance, or you lose with a 1 in 6 chance. So how do we represent losing in Russian Roulette? Can we just put a zero here? No, as it turns out, a value of zero would signify no gain or loss. In this scenario, the expected value would be about $833,000, which would be a trivial decision. Play the game. No, to represent losing in Russian Roulette, we need a negative value. But what should this value be? We need it to accurately measure the expected value, but how do we find it? How do you quantify the value of a human life? As it turns out, policymakers, insurance companies, and regulators have grappled with this question for decades. In the past half century, various approaches and methods have been developed to try and tackle the issue. One of the most notable was introduced by famed American economist Thomas Schelling in his seminal essay, The Life You Save May Be Your Own. The essay discusses how societies might evaluate the economic value of reducing mortality rate. Schelling hoped to avoid the moral thicket of quantifying human life by instead thinking in terms of risk, which, as we will see, ultimately failed. His work laid the foundation for a concept that would soon follow, the value of a statistical life, or VSL. Despite what its name might suggest, VSL does not measure what individuals personally would trade for their own lives, but rather how much they value a small reduction in mortality risk. For example, if a population of 1 million people are each willing to pay $1 to reduce the mortality rate by 1 in a million, then the VSL is calculated as $1 million to save a single life. With this method, society determines the value of life through our willingness to pay for slightly safer conditions. VSL is used in industries such as healthcare and transportation to make cost-benefit decisions, like is the lower mortality rate worth the fiscal cost? Is the juice worth the squeeze? And this is why VSL is so controversial. It assigns monetary value to lives in order to make cost-benefit decisions. Should we be weighing lives on a scale like this? Is this morally acceptable? Perhaps not. However, despite the ethical concerns, this approach is essential for making macro decisions that affect us all. Take for instance, car accidents. In 2022, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration reported 42,795 fatalities in the US. While tragic, there's a really straightforward solution for this, just reducing the speed limit. If we were to reduce the national speed limit to 13 miles per hour, the mortality rate from car accidents would fall to approximately zero. But is it worth it? 
chances are you would agree it's not. The loss in productivity and convenience would be so large that we as a society are willing to tolerate thousands of deaths each year to avoid that loss. This also highlights why we talk about the value of a statistical life rather than the value of a life. Statistical lives are worth less than unique identifiable ones. This can be a really odd concept to wrap your head around as they're both human lives, but it's a universal phenomenon. This is why specific tragedies such as the Tam Luang cave rescue where a Thai youth football team trapped in a cave were saved by an international effort costing tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, often garner more support. Broader, less personal tragedies like the millions of Africans lacking access to clean drinking water receive less attention. So now that we've established that under certain conditions, you can in fact put a price on life, let's examine how this plays out in the real world. In recent decades, cancer has become one of the leading causes of death worldwide. About 10 million people die from cancer each year, making it responsible for roughly one in every six deaths. In our desperation to combat the big C, the FDA has begun approving a wide array of potential cancer medications, many of which are incredibly expensive. This trend persists partly because the FDA cannot approve or reject medications based on price, leading to a growing number of exorbitantly priced cancer treatments that only offer marginal benefits. Take for instance the 2008 meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. One of the announcements was the result of a multi-institutional European drug trial, which found a correlation between the drug cetuximab and increased overall survival of non-small cell lung cancer patients by around 1.2 months. However, this extra 1.2 months came with significantly higher rates of rashes, diarrhea, and febrile neutropenia, a serious complication where the body can't fight infection due to low white blood cell counts. In other words, this extra time is of severely diminished quality. Cetuximab was also originally approved by the FDA to treat colorectal cancer after a study linked it to an increased overall survival in patients by 1.7 months when combined with another drug called ironotecan. Again, this extra time was marred by skin toxicity in 85% of patients, with 18.7% of cases being severe and life-threatening. This raises the question, are these clinical trials breakthroughs in medicine? Are these marginal improvements in overall survival worth the cost to the patient? This question becomes even more pertinent when considering the cost not only to the patient, but also to society. In the US, 18 weeks of cetuximab treatment for non-small cell lung cancer costs an average of $80,000, which extrapolates to $800,000 to prolong the life of a patient by one year. Using VSLY, value of a statistical life year, which, as the name suggests, is just the value society places on a single year of life rather than the whole life, we would need approximately $440 billion, an amount nearly 100 times the budget of the National Cancer Institute, to extend the life of the 550,000 Americans who died of cancer in 2008 by a single year. And this is just to prolong the lives of the patients, not cure them. Once again, we're faced with another situation that forces us to confront the moral dilemma of quantifying human lives. Is this extension of life worth the cost? For instance, the UK's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence typically values the quality adjusted life year at around 20 to 30,000 pounds. This metric, similar to VSLY, incorporates not only the duration, but also the quality of life gained. For instance, an extra year of perfect health in the UK is typically valued at about 30,000 pounds, whereas a year marked by debilitating illness might be appraised at half that amount. Applying the UK's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence valuations, this translates to approximately $63,525 for a year of perfect health in the US. In light of this, our previous valuation of $800,000 for a year of not perfect health seems outrageous. These treatments are not cost effective, surely the cost outweighs the benefits in this scenario. But maybe not. Human life is something widely considered to be sacred. All of this talk of quantifying human life only applies to statistical lives, not unique ones, right? After all, in some sense, every life is of infinite value. Or is it? Let's return to our game of Russian Roulette. Initially, we sought to find a value for x2, the value of human life, to calculate the expected value of playing the game. 
And while we can't determine the value of a life, we can find the value of a statistical life. Fortunately, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has taken the liberty for us, estimating the value of a statistical life for an American in 2024 to range between $6.1 million to $19.9 million, with a central estimate at around $13.1 million. So let's assume that we're boring and average. If we were to plug in this value into our equation, we would find that, on average, playing the game is not worthwhile. The expected value is not only negative, but also significant, at approximately negative $1.35 million. For many, this revelation probably doesn't come as much of a surprise. Most people probably wouldn't need to run the numbers to determine that the money isn't worth risking their lives. But here's where things get interesting. Imagine that we make one adjustment to the rules. All of the rules hold, except now we're playing with a magic gun that can expand or shrink the number of chambers in it at will. There's still a single bullet in the chamber, but now there are, let's say, a hundred chambers. Would you play now? The values of the outcomes remain unchanged, but now the chance of success has increased from approximately 83.3% to 99%. Now our expected value has skyrocketed to a positive 859,000, theoretically making it the rational choice to play. At this point, the low probability of failure and the high reward would persuade significantly more people to play. But what about the holdouts? Well, now what if we increase the number of chambers to a thousand? A million? A trillion? One septillion? Eventually, the chance of failure would become so infinitesimally small that virtually everyone on the planet would be inclined to play. The odds of losing would become rarer than being struck by lightning five times consecutively. Yet, herein lies the ethical dilemma. Playing acknowledges that our lives possess a finite value. Regardless of how minuscule the risk becomes and how substantial the potential reward, Participation acknowledges that there's a price tag attached to our existence. Consider this scenario mathematically. Suppose we valued our lives at 1.2 quadrillion, the upper estimate of the global money supply. Now imagine a gun with 1.2 quadrillion chambers and a single bullet. The expected value of the game would suggest that playing is indisputably worthwhile. No matter how astronomically high we value our lives monetarily, we can engineer a failure probability so infinitesimally small that playing becomes an unequivocal decision. To assert that our lives are of infinite value would require us to refrain from playing under any circumstances. But what about those who refuse to participate regardless of the odds? What about the Elon Musks and Jeff Bezos of the world who have so much money that playing, no matter how low the risk, isn't deemed worthwhile. Are their lives of infinite value? Well, maybe. Consider this extreme scenario. Let's say every single person on the planet, except for one individual, let's call him Joey, participated in our game. By playing, each participant effectively places a value on their own life, no matter how high. The collective value of everyone's life, though extraordinarily high, would remain finite. Now, consider this paradox. According to logical reasoning, Joey's life would be valued more than the combined worth of all others, as his life's value is infinite and everyone's else is finite. Therefore, it logically follows that Joey should prioritize his survival over that of the entire human population, given his life's greater perceived value. For Joey to reject this logic would imply that his life's value is not infinite and is in fact less than the rest of humanity's, thereby acknowledging its finiteness. In this scenario, if Joey were to make the rational choice of sacrificing the entire human population for his own survival, then perhaps we could argue that his life's value is infinite. Go Joey. Ah! Ultimately, while the concept of quantifying life via risk has existed for multiple decades now, I found that nothing hammers this point home quite like the game of Russian Roulette. And I think it's because while VSL and all these other metrics focus on statistical lives, numbers on a spreadsheet basically, Russian Roulette puts us on the chopping block. It forces us to confront the numbers we're running cost-benefit analysis on are real human lives. People with families. People who dream of making their mark on the world. People who struggle to assemble IKEA furniture. 
People who get frustrated sitting at the DMV. People who are scared of never finding love. Maybe our lives aren't infinite, but perhaps Russian Roulette can remind us that these strangers that we interact with on a daily basis, these unidentifiable people, are more than just numbers. Ironically, maybe Russian Roulette can teach us to empathize and value ourselves and others more. But anyways, that's all I got for you guys today. This one was a lot of fun to make, but it took a really long time to make, like a month. So it mean a lot if you guys subscribed if you enjoyed it. And I'm also really curious though, how low would the odds have to be for you to play? That's essentially how this entire video came to be is I was just obsessed with that one question. So leave a comment below because I'm really interested to hear your guys' answers. But yeah, have a good one guys. And until next time, 